On this edition of Native Report, we attend a rehearsal session with Blue Dog as they play some original blues rock arrangements. We then travel to the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and meet tribal historian Loretta Matoxen. And we learn about intergenerational trauma from Dr. Martin Brokenleg. We also learn about what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. Blues rock band Blue Dog formed in 2001. Their sound is influenced by life experiences of Native people. The band received the debut Artist of the Year at the 2010 Native American Music Awards. Join us now as we attend a rehearsal session and learn more about a band that is in every sense of the word, a family. Dog formed in 2001 by Joni and Eric Buffalohead, and they released their first recording in 2005. Their music is influenced by the life experiences of Native people. We wanted something that would connect with the blues community and also connect with the Native community. So we thought, you know, we thought, oh, well, Black Dog, but there's already a band called that. And Red Dog, there's an energy drink or something, so we're just going through the colors. What's next? Blue, blues, dog, blue dog. That's kind of where it came out of, I think. Uh, you know, we, we kicked around some other names for ideas, and I think that's really where it kind of boiled down to, is, hey, we want this name that'll, you know, connect with both of these communities we want to connect with, the blues community, but we don't want to give up what it is to be native either. We want to be known as a native blues band. I was looking for something we could connect, you know, if we had to be, you know, boxed in a, a style, because that's what we learned when we first formed Blue Dog. Um, you know, what kind of music are you to find and what match, you know, to match you and what venue you're going to play at. What I contribute to Blue Dog is, I would say, documentation of history. It's real life experiences of Native, Native people. I've been in the band since I was, I think, about 16 or 15 when we first started. I did um, piano lessons when I was maybe seven or eight and didn't really enjoy practicing classical music. And our, my teacher told my parents that I wasn't interested and so she kind of stopped doing the lessons. When I started doing backup vocals with the band, I, my, my dad said, you should play keys, like you should put your lessons to work. My parents offered, they said, you should sit in with us and it was, so scary before and then during when we were performing with them and then after it was the most thrilling high or experience. I got the bug is what they told me. Rounding out the Native American Music Award winning band is bassist Tom Seuss and drummer Greg Manns. 
Blue Dog has performed at numerous sites in and around the Twin Cities metro area and have played at music festivals across the Midwest. We had people like Buffy St. Marie at the house when she was in town when I was a kid and um, you know, Dad was always, always had these records on from the Stones and Eric Clapton and you know, we just always were musical and, and there was always going on and there was always this tradition too of, um, and our family's all singers down, down home in Ponca, right? So I was always kind of drawn to like, well, I'm not there, I'm not on the drum, but I do have this, this inner desire to do something musical. But we've had, you know, the opportunity to play with legendary people. Buddy Guy and Bernard Allison and Indigenous, that was uh, incredible. Bernard Allison, he comes from the blues, you know, um, royalty, I'll say, out of Chicago, and he heard our latest CD, and he made the comment of, you know, you and my toe, you know, from Indigenous, you, you guys got that sound. There's, just a, there's a native sound to it. There's something there um, that's different. And I was like, wow, really? You notice, you know, it's different? Because um, I thought we kind of just blended it. <laughs> we have really been blessed. We played this show and the next day I was going to Mexico for the next six months to study and I just thought, what if I'm never able to do this again? And then I think from then on I just really appreciated that I'm able to share this with my parents and with our, our family. Obstructive sleep apnea is a fairly common diagnosis that causes a lot of problems. Many people with this condition are not aware they have it or don't think it's a significant issue. Apnea means without air and this is exactly what happens. The normal sleep cycle includes rapid eye movement or REM sleep and during this time the muscle tone in the body is decreased. What happens with sleep apnea is that the muscles and tissues in the airway relax and collapse and narrow the airway. The tongue often falls back and blocks the airway. If you blow up a balloon, and let it go, it makes that flapping sound because the air pressure pushes the neck of the balloon open, then the elasticity of the rubber slams it shut, then the air pressure in the balloon forces the neck open, then the elasticity slams it shut, and so on. If you try to do that in the other direction by breathing in when you sleep, the same effect causes snoring as long as the airway is partially open. Eventually, those tissues relax until the negative pressure pulls the airway closed and there's nothing that will pull it open again. The negative pressure from trying to take that breath pulls the airway closed tighter and tighter. This is how an apnea episode begins and they typically last from 20 to 40 seconds before the sleeper awakens with a gasp and reopens their airway. Except they don't really wake up and are usually never aware this just happened. They go back to sleep and the cycle begins again. Most people I see with sleep apnea have partners who send them in or who come in with them to visits to make sure this is addressed. Obstructive sleep apnea increases the risks for heart attacks, strokes, depression, obesity, high blood pressure, and other things that are generally not good. The hallmark of obstructive sleep apnea is daytime sleepiness and this can range from falling asleep during the day when not actively engaged in something to falling asleep at the steering wheel. Other symptoms are restless sleep, insomnia, morning headaches, mood changes including depression and irritability, forgetfulness, and difficulty concentrating. High blood pressure and difficulty losing weight are sometimes things I see that make me open a discussion about obstructive sleep apnea. 
Sleep apnea tends to get worse with age, and factors that make it worse are obesity, alcohol, and some drugs including sedatives and muscle relaxers. Smoking causes inflammation of the tissues in the airway and worsens the problem. The most common test to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea is polysomnography, or a sleep study. During a sleep study, multiple elements are monitored, including heart rate, EKG tracings, oxygen levels, and other indicators. A normal oxygen level is 95 to 100 percent, and anything below 90 percent can be dangerously low. I sent someone in for a sleep study once, and he woke up over a hundred times in eight hours and wasn't aware of any of them, and his oxygen saturation dropped to 74 percent. The most common treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure. This is an air pump with a mask that seals tightly over the mouth and nose. The pressure is set to just keep the airway open. They're sometimes a little bit weird to get used to, but they work very well. Sometimes a mouth guard that holds the bottom jaw forward is enough to keep the airway open. Surgery is sometimes used for severe cases. Weight loss and smoking cessation are always encouraged. A newer treatment stimulates the base of the tongue to keep it from falling back and blocking the airway. Obstructive sleep apnea is common and may well be affecting you or someone you care about. This is treatable and your health care provider can help you get started. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vinio and this is Health Matters. Loretta Metoxen is a respected elder and a tribal historian for the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. She was born and raised on the Oneida Reservation and served in tribal leadership for nearly 30 years. A day doesn't go by without her learning something new about the Oneida Nation. The Oneida Nation of Wisconsin has a long and storied history. Loretta Metoxen, the keeper of that knowledge, looks after the nation's history with a passion. Tribal historian is very okay. exciting. I use what knowledge I have gained over the last uh, 60, 70 years uh, to enrich other people by teaching, researching, writing, um, spreading any kind of information that I might have about laws that affect tribes, uh, especially this tribe. I study every day and I learn something new every day. It's a miracle that we are here, that we are here at all because we survived the Revolutionary War where many of our men were killed. Uh, the women also fought in the Revolutionary War. And after the war, uh, quickly on the heels of the war came the Indian Removal Act. And uh, President Jackson was bound that all the tribes east of the Mississippi were going west and we were one of them. So history, all of that detail of daily living for our ancestors is, is really, um, really exciting. It's more exciting than anything you can get on TV, as far as I'm concerned. Born and raised on the Oneida Reservation, Loretta served in the U.S. Air Force during the Korean War. I'm uh, an Oneida woman who was raised on a farm here on the reservation, and I volunteered for the United States Air Force when I was 18 years old. The United States Air Force uh, saw fit to put me in uh, uh, airborne radar school, airborne radar technician school. After a year, when I got my orders, it said Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts, and I thought, oh my gosh, where is Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts? I thought it would be the end of the earth, and I didn't know it was Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and I, that's where I was sent, and I was a sergeant on the flight line there, in charge of all the ra airborne radar on two flights of planes, the 58th and the 59th fighter squadrons, 
I was the non-commissioned officer in charge of all the radar equipment that went into those those planes and um, to install them and repair that equipment and I was in charge of the 564th field maintenance radar shop that did that work. Loretta also served on the Oneida Business Committee, the governing body of the Oneida Nation for nearly 30 years. While on the council, she strongly disagreed with the passage of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, a major piece of legislation that affected all of Indian country. I was in Washington when uh, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was passed out of committee in May of 1988. It would be passed uh, on the floor, I think, in uh, October of the same year. There were two other major, major leaders who opposed that act, and those were Roger Jordan and Wendell Chino. And they said, and I agreed with them, uh, didn't, didn't affect anything, but they said it was uh, unconstitutional. And I agreed with them because of the Commerce Clause in the United States Constitution that says only the United States will deal in commerce with the tribes. Well, this law gave the control, the regulation to the respective states. So that is the part that is unconstitutional. I believe it yet today. Loretta does recognize the positive economic impact the piece of legislation has had across Indian country. But her focus now is on the history and retention of the Oneida culture. It could be argued that she herself is a treasure of the nation. My hopes for the future of the Oneida Nation are that 17,100 Oneidas, they need to know this stuff. They need to know where they came from. They need to know the hardships that their grandparents survived through, and, and that's why they're still here. That's what they need to know so that they can uh, help one another, uh, contribute to the nation. Uh, they, they need to know that uh, because each one who contributes will make, will make the nation stronger to that extent. So that's what I think needs to happen. It can't happen fast enough. born at a very young age in <laughs> Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, 63 years ago. Uh, my parents, my dad went and found, found work there, so we lived off the reservation for a couple of years, and then we moved from there to Duluth, and we lived on uh, uh, Garfield Avenue when there was houses there by the railroad tracks there, and in the late 50s, we. My father built a little shack over here, and we moved back to the reservation, which was made everybody glad, especially my mother. She didn't like the influence of the big city. So, and then everybody was back home again because across the road was my grandma and grandpa, and you know, all the family is here. This is a real close, tight-knit family, our little village. So, uh, and, uh, Eventually, we outgrew that house right, it was just a hundred yards that way, and we moved to a house right here. And I lived here till uh, 1969, and then uh, 1984, I moved back, and I got this same piece of land and the trees in my yard my mother and dad planted. So I'm home. <laughs> Dr. Martin Brokenleg grew up on the Rosebud Reservation and went on to become a psychologist, therapist, and author who has trained people around the world 
to more effectively work with at-risk youth. He has a vision for how indigenous communities and families can raise successful, resilient children in the face of intergenerational trauma. Dr. Brokenleg sat down with Christina Woods for an in-depth conversation about his work. Well, thank you, Dr. Broken Lake, for being here with us today to talk about the efforts that you're making to try and develop resiliency in children. Mm -hmm. I would like first to ask you to help us understand what you mean when you talk about intergenerational trauma. Okay, it's a complicated big area, and I think first of all, we don't want to think about what trauma is. The simplest definition I know is when your emotional system is overwhelmed. That happens to everybody. Everybody gets traumatized, and human beings are designed to get over occasional trauma. But intergenerational trauma is, is a different category because it is the result of, of frequent, maybe even daily, uh, trauma. Essentially, the definition I use comes from uh, Dr. Mariah Braveheart. And she says it is a, a dark energy that, that is uh, cumulative, first of all, meaning it, it gains energy uh, as, it, as it matures. So each generation ex can experience a more severe form. Uh, if your parents went to residential school, for example, um, you would have a fairly intense level of trauma, but if you don't do your healing work, your children will have a more severe form of that trauma. And psychologically, the, re the, the reason that exists is because um, emotional self-management is an important tool that every child needs to learn. Uh, but what happened to the people who, went, who, who experienced the first wave of trauma, whether that was war, which it often was in the U.S., in Canada it was the residential school experience, what that, what, what that first generation of people often do is shut themselves down emotionally. And so they never become skilled at, at handling themselves emotionally. And then they can't teach that to their children. Whereas in traditional cultures, uh, the older generation teach the next generation about how to, this is what you do when you're angry, or this is our ceremony for mourning, or whatever it is. So intergenerational trauma gets worse with each generation. Uh, one of the clues that somebody should know, that a person should know, I've experienced this, is if you're embarrassed by it, if you want to hide it. But the real problem with, with intergenerational trauma is it affects all aspects of a human being. It affects how we think and perceive reality. It affects our emotional world. It affects us spiritually, sexually, our social contacts, um, our spontaneity. Even it, it even affects us genetically. There's there's a field of study called epigenetics, which it, which has documented that genes have on-off switches, and trauma turns all those switches, flips all those switches, so that. If I've been traumatized, my children will be born with those conditions, whether I'm male or female. This is a persistent condition. It will not go away because it permanently alters how we, f how we think, how we function. It, it alters our brain chemistry. So all of our function is, uh, is influenced permanently after that. Now, this doesn't mean you can't live a life that's happy and joyful and free and all of that, but it takes work. Many people have thought there must be something wrong with native people, for example, indigenous people. Uh, because we have so many social problems and physical problems and addiction issues and all those kinds of dynamics, uh, there's nothing wrong with us. It's the result of that trauma. Uh, we react to the way any human being would react to it. It seems like it's such an important first step for our communities to first of all know that this is a condition. Yes. And then secondly, like what are the first couple of steps that mm -hmm families or community could use mm -hmm. to start that healing process. What I encourage people to do, first of all, is to admit that we have it, because we do. Uh, there isn't any indigenous person I have met who doesn't carry traces of it. So admitting that we have it means we, we are starting to leave that position of victimhood. Uh, a typical victim hides whatever has happened to him or her. There is a new practice, well, I guess it's not new, but it's, it's, a, it's new in the sense that it's recently popular, uh, a practice called mindfulness meditation, which has spectacular results, and it only takes about 10 minutes a day. And then after that would be the processes of learning what do we do with our emotion when we have it. It's normal to be happy, it's normal to be disappointed, it's normal to be hurt and, 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 and fearful. Uh, if, once we can acknowledge all of those, then we have to figure out how do we work with all of those pieces. 
So the admission, I think, is probably the, impo the important first step. Yes, I'm wounded. Now what do I do about it? Uh, one of my slogans is, it's what we do next that matters. My conversation about resilience continues with Dr. Brokenleg. Next time on Native Report, we'll discuss how we start to heal intergenerational trauma, creating successful students, and facing racism. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Partial funding for this episode of Native Report is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.